and what projects have you been have you been working on? Okay, well, you know, we're still, uh, I think, reeling from the recession. You know, other other parts of the economy might be bouncing back, but the boat industry is still pretty tough. Uh, we've we've maintained uh, a steady flow of work, but we've diversified into uh, some Coast Guard and and military stuff that we never used to do. I'd say four years ago we had never done uh, any kind of a, uh, a Navy or commercial project, and now it's about a third of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're launching a, a new venture with a guy uh, for both the, it's probably the closest uh, to being a personal project for me uh, of anything that I've ever done. So that's really rewarding right well, now. Well, can you let me in on it? Or? Well, you know, we're, we're not really ready to say too much, but it's, uh, it's kind of a lightweight trawler. Uh, and it's, uh, I think, a surprise for a lot of people that associate us with high-speed boats uh, to be doing something that will be a, a 15 to 20 knot boat. And I think most people would be surprised to know that that actually gets me really excited. But it's, it's much more of a boat that appeals to my personal way of, of I, how I think people use boats. I think boats are often designed about around an idea of, of what people want as opposed to the experience telling them, okay, now that I'm in a bigger boat, this is what I really want. And so this boat's really appealing to me that it doesn't try to do too much. Yeah. Now, we did a, a question and answer segment um, a couple of years ago. I think you mentioned this project. It was a trawler that went um, a displacement. It was a displacement trawler that gave off this tiny wake and made it was completely you know, economical. Well, what, what's is funny is, well, it, it's similar. What's funny is that during a kind of a lull uh, three or four years ago, uh, I started designing a boat that I would like to build for myself, and I named it Adele, and it was a uh, ULDB, ultralight displacement boat, uh, narrow, very light displacement, very uh, minimum accommodations, kind of like a, a sailor's interior. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was about a year, uh, a year or more, uh, we had a client approach us, started to describe the boat uh, that they wanted to do, and as we began to draw it up, it was kind of taking on some strange proportions, and they didn't like it, and I didn't like it. And then they came back and said, why don't you tell us what you would do? And we kind of slid it more towards the boat that I was drawing for myself, and it really developed a fresh look to it. And uh, that's where we're going now. Um, you mentioned your boat. Um, tell the viewers uh, a little bit about it. We know it's a birch. Room. What's the size? What's the power? How do you use it here in Sarasota? Well, it's a, uh, it's a 1971 uh, 25-foot Bertram that I completely customized uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and then uh, two years ago, we redid it again. So it's, you know, under my ownership, it's gone through two complete renovations. And, uh, you know, it's, it's set up like a pickup truck where the whole stern of the boat is completely wide open. And, um, but we've used it for everything from water skiing to tubing to uh, one time I, I took a 15-foot uh, boat trailer down in it. It's, uh, but it's just been sort of the all-around family boat. And my kids now are in age where they're like, okay, you don't get to sell this. We've had it our whole lives. So... It's in the family for good. I had a 502 uh, Merc Cruiser in it with a Mercury Drive. It now has a Mercury Drive with a Volvo 454 in it, I think. And uh, what's amazing is the 454 runs the same speed that the old 502 did. Uh -huh. So more efficient, newer engine, getting the same speed out of it. Uh -huh. Before we go further, though, we do have... We, we should tell everyone about the dog that's sort of under the table here because that's why we're jostling about. Why don't we just it's say hello? Let yeah. him say hello. Come on, come on Scott. And then, and then we'll just... Come on. Then we'll get rid of you. Come on, on Scott. We're going to just rip, move, the, move the... Come on, buddy. Okay, there he is. There you okay. are. Scupper's <laughs> on video. <laughs> There's the back of him. Oh, anyway. Turn around, buddy. Well, the race boats are interesting because uh, when I first opened my, my office in uh, 1981, uh, almost everything that I did was based on uh, race boats. Uh, I actually had a little shop where we were building them. But as time went on, uh, we found that we weren't getting any work other than that. And so I got very frustrated 
that I was so closely associated with race boats that I wasn't getting any other opportunities. Yeah. And now we fast forward to where we are today, and I run into a lot of people who have no idea that we ever did any race boats. Uh, how much of a role does do the advancements in propulsion? Propulsion, most recently the pods, the joysticks, making boating and docking easier. How, does that play a role in your design uh, process? Well, basically, every time somebody comes up with an innovative propulsion uh, system, it gives us a lot more work. Uh, because what you'll have is uh, a lot of manufacturers will come back and want to update their product uh, to incorporate the new drive systems. And so for us, it's always an opportunity. It's always more sort of tools in the tool bag. Um, we certainly, we like the pods. I've been very, uh, uh, very supportive of them. Uh, I think uh, it's sort of, you live a long time with conventional drive systems, and as soon as you see a solution like that, it's like, why would you go back? And so our attitude is sort of, if there was a pod for every size and speed that we need, we would always go to that as our first solution. Um, and we would get away from conventional shafting as much as possible. Uh, the only drawback is sometimes the weight of the system or the cost of the system. Mm -hmm. But we're waiting for that gap to fill in. And there's still a gap uh, that we, there isn't a good solution for a number of sizes of boats because uh, with sort of small boats you're okay and very big boats you're okay, but then there's a size range in between where you have to go into uh, triple and quad installations, which I still uh, don't think uh, is very acceptable for the market. So what uh, size boats and types boat, type of boats uh, do you think are most geared toward receiving the pod propulsion packages? Well, right now you can do a pretty good pod installation from about, say, 35 feet through 55 feet. Then you start getting into the triple and quad installations. Uh, the new ZF system uh, will handle boats in the 60 and 70 foot range but there's actually very few of those uh, out at this point, so we're a little reluctant to do a big series based on them. Uh, once you get above about 70 feet, you have to get into some, what I think are some pretty convoluted uh, combinations of quads that I don't think are acceptable for the market. When you get real large, you start getting into um, ship type systems where you can do as large as you want, but there's definitely a gap above 70 feet. The um, and we're not just talking about pods. I mean, the whole joystick movement has gone way beyond the pod itself, and has incorporated now even outboards and certainly stern drives and this whole the whole joystick movement. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in some ways, very disappointing for me, because I think a lot of us that grew up with boats and that are really proud of being able to spin a single engine boat around. And, and back it down through a, yeah. you know, a, a narrow channel uh, with cross current and know how to do all that. Took a lot of pride in the fact that we knew how to really handle boats. Um, I was, uh, when they first started coming out with uh, all the different joystick systems, I was like, man, that really just means anybody can run it. And I realized that's the industry's goal. Well, it, it kind of goes counter to me where it's nice to actually be able to know how to do it without it. Um, but it is to, it's to attract people that would be uncomfortable in a boat or a boat of a certain size uh, without that kind of a system. Um, I think it, it makes a person a lot feel a lot more secure that if they didn't grow up with that kind of a background that they could handle a 50 or, or 60 foot boat mm -hmm. without having a big crew or a captain. What, um, you know, as a seasoned mariner, would you recommend that even though people can you know, operate a boat with a joystick, they should still learn the basic skills and seamanship skills? Well, you, I would, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not sure that that's very practical. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, by the way, I've, I've always thought that was why the sailboat market was so much smaller than the powerboat market. Uh, because as a novice, you can go get a powerboat and learn to drive it fairly efficient, uh, you know, so, excuse me, uh, that you can have some proficiency in how you handle it. Yeah. Uh, but a sailboat is just an embarrassing thing if you didn't grow up sailing. Yeah. So who wants to own a 40-foot sailboat uh, and, and not know how to, <laughs> how to do anything with it? Yeah, exactly. Peters. Well, you know, from my point of view, uh, most boat buyers are looking for the wrong thing. 
Uh, it reminds me of uh, people here, here in Sarasota that build uh, huge houses with five bedrooms, hoping that the grandkids will come join them for uh, a few times a year. Uh, and I think people look for boats that have too many cabins, sleep too many people, cut up too much, and I think that it comes from not having a lot of experience with a boat as to how you would actually use it if you had it. And so it's, it's always a bit of a frustration to see how much um, individuals want to pack into a boat or a boat company wants to be able to promote, uh, whereas sometimes the best boat has a lot less in it. Um, it's funny, this weekend uh, we took our neighbors out in, in my old Bertram, and the first thing everybody always says is, I've just never been in a boat like this. And I said, well, I call it a pickup truck, because there's no seats in it, except for the, the you know, one central helm seat. And, and everybody's like, you know, but it's, it's so nice to be on that boat. And I said, that's because you're enjoying the fact that it's open, that you can do anything you want in it, sit anywhere you want, you can bring chairs aboard if, if that's what you want. But I think most modern boats try to uh, anticipate where everybody might want to sit, might want to lay down, might want to do something. And the fact is, just open deck space sometimes is the nicest thing you can have. Boat builders uh, have been telling me that people continue to want more, 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 more creature comforts, more technology. Um, what about the technology? The uh, you know the iPods and the um, the sharing of information, the integration. Um, that seems to be where we're going. Um, do you think that's the case? And, and if so, it, it's it's definitely where we're going. I don't relate to it at all. I, I personally don't carry a cell phone. I don't even wear a watch, and I can't understand why when people go out on a boat, they want to be bothered with all that stuff. Yeah. I know it's reality, and we have to plan for it all, but it's something that I don't personally relate to at all. Right. So you're old school. <laughs> I'm old school. How, could the, how can uh, boaters use the boat show to their benefit? Well, I mean... The one thing I do think that you get is that when you go on a boat by itself, it, it's, very, it's often very impressive. But when you go on boat after boat, you really start to see the quality difference. That if you looked at a boat that you were really happy with by itself, as soon as you look at its competition next to it, you get a much better uh, you know, current comparison that your mind can't carry if it was like a week apart. But because these are minutes apart, you really you really understand the difference. I have to ask you now, what's your least favorite part of a boat show? Well, the worst thing that a client can ask me to do is to go through the electronic section. And I patiently try to do it once in a while, but basically walking the aisles and looking at the newest gadgets for electronics uh, is real challenging for me. I, I've had a hard time understanding why people are so fascinated uh, with their GPS chart rather than just looking out the window and enjoying where they're going.